Hello, something guys and gals. This is something guy 912. I keep telling myself again and again that I don't want to entertain people who don't believe anything they have to say on any topic video games, movies, history, feminism, you name it. But with Anita Sarkeesian, I just can't help myself. She is so patently full of shit, so intentionally misleading and intellectually dishonest. And worst of all, she's not only conned the games industry with her talking points, but she's conned the feminists out of their hopefully hard-earned wallets. That every time that I watch other YouTubers tackle her arguments, it is so mind-bogglingly infuriating how wrong she gets each time she tries to critique. And so, in May of 2017, five years into a project that has been delayed, backtracked, and ultimately decided by Sarkeesian to be over with, her Lady Psychic series, despite the fact that she still hasn't completed 25% of the remaining work, and that's me being generous considering the topics of videos she's done, and has been roughly four years late considering the funding period of the Kickstarter, which is still up, mind you. Anita puts the final nail in the coffin with the Lady Psychic, just another example of how you can paint your patronizing behavior to any women in video games, just as long as you obfuscate your language to the point that it's supposed to be endearing. And after all the dust has settled, with countless claims of harassment, all the cries about feminists shrieking that Anita really does love video games, and is not doing this for a paycheck or for some kind of narrative, Anita herself has admitted that this entire fem freak show was nothing more for social justice, and the video games was just a vehicle to push it. So you hear me? Vox and Gawker and Huffington Post, she was never a fan of video games, we the gamers knew she wasn't a fan of video games, and she never gave a shit unless it suited her bottom line, you clickbait shitting, hit piece spewing crybabies. So to sink the ship on the ultimate legacy of this series, I will do my last video on Anita's last Tropes vs. Women in Gaming. It might be over for Anita, but I certainly will believe that it won't be the last that we will see a feminist attempt to critique gaming media in some capacity. Take it away, Sam Skeezian. Okay, it looks like I can open them from here, but I won't be able to come in with you. Here goes. Actually, I should have said, take it away, Alex. Since, of course, Anita plays a random video game clip that tangentially has something to do with the topic, followed with an introductory of another video game. The format has really gone stale at this point, Anita. But as for Alex being a lady sidekick, while I am presuming a lot from just a clip, you would think that Alex Vance is one of the better examples of a lady sidekick, someone who isn't so overtly sexualized, even though people sexualize her regardless, and an NPC follower with charisma who also is not invincible in combat, as a companion that you need to keep alive should be. But of course, since social justice is the way we view things in video games, not through a video game perspective, like with how escort missions are one of the worst aspects of gameplay followed by quick time events, we need to poke sticks in every little hole we can possibly find. In 2013, 2K Games released Bioshock Infinite, the eagerly anticipated follow-up to the earlier hugely successful Bioshock games. Ahem! If you don't count Bioshock 2 in that lineup. Infinite's story centers on a man named Booker DeWitt, a private investigator with a bloody past who takes on a mysterious assignment. Hey Anita, what happened to all of the red highlights you used to tell in your prior videos? Is the money running dry so you can only afford blonde highlights? Also, I know I've already beat this horse to death a million times already, but for someone who really hates gender signifiers, you sure do have quite a bit of them. Highlights, long flowing hair, pinpricked eyebrows, and those same hoopy earrings from the beginning of your Kickstarter. But this is old hat now, and we basically know you are a hypocrite at every turn. Now tell me how playing a male protagonist is sexist, and playing a female protagonist is also sexist. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. I know right now Anita is internally screaming about the women as reward trope in this line, yet the line itself has about as much narrative importance as Would you kindly did in Bioshock 1. Not to mention, Shiver really is very selectively sexist to feminists when it suits them, because I imagine that Anita would be upset that Booker didn't try to help Elizabeth at every cost. Never mind that, though. I'm sure Anita will find a way to twist something taken out of context to suit her own ends, as she does everything else! 
What follows is Booker's adventure to the flying city of Columbia, where the girl, Elizabeth, has been imprisoned in a tower for her entire life. Busting her out of captivity while well, she busts out of her corset, Booker shoots his way across Columbia, getting caught up in all sorts of drama in the process. You know, Anita, Elizabeth actually dresses conservatively at the start of the adventure and then changes to the more revealing corset later after her dress gets all kinds of messed up from the fighting. While you might have been doing some flavorful dialogue in this instance, I think it was just your social little social dresses brain working out the chinks of the game in your own triggered flavor. As the game tells players a garbage story which suggests that oppressed people are just as bad as their oppressors and that the truth is always somewhere in the middle. Here is the part where I am absolutely convinced that Anita hasn't played the game, much less care about what goes on in the story. There is a huge narrative twist at the end of Bioshock Infinite that left me rattled for several days pondering, yet Anita is so quick to hand wave it as a garbage story, despite her earlier refrain of it being an eagerly anticipated follow-up. Also, Anita, it's not that oppressed people are just as bad, but that they can be just as bad as the oppressors. In Infinite, Daisy Fitzroy is convinced that all bad things are passed down, trying to kill Jeremiah Fink's son, as she personally hates Jeremiah and thinks that you can only kill the weeds if you cut them by the root. It's a paraphrased quote, but an interesting one at that. It's like how Antifa are convinced that they are justifying their every action because they paint themselves up as the oppressed, so that even if they murder a litter of kittens in broad daylight with a smile on their face, that that somehow is okay because the litter of kittens had a swastika on the side of the box, or that the litter of kittens were owned by some Nazi they applied the label to. Also, Anita, have you ever once considered that sometimes arguing against the status quo is fucking retarded? Like, flat earthers who are convinced to this day that the world is flat are somehow on the right because they are going against the grain almost for the sake of it? Not to say that Columbia had some fucked up morals and status, but the point is, Anita, fighting against the system for the sake of it is stupid in and of itself. But of course, truth is always somewhere in the middle in games, but for Anita, she always knows the truth, she interprets the truth, she makes the truth. And the truth shall set you free! But that's much too big a can of worms for us to open in this video. Oh yeah, that's just too much work for Anita considering that she said that her videos would be 10 to 20 minutes in length and would be made by the middle of 2012 no less. Oh, if Anita had to tackle the big identity crisis of Booker DeWitt or the infinite, pun not intended, span of parallel universes, you'd think that her calling the game trash for its story was almost bullshit. It's not like you were paid to talk about video games for fuck's sake, Anita! Let's just focus on Elizabeth. Oh yeah, let's, Anita. Fuck the gameplay, fuck the story, fuck the protagonist. Let's focus on only one quarter of the game. Just how you only focus on one quarter of your promised Kickstarter goal, you disingenuous hack. Elizabeth possesses an incredible ability to open portals to other timelines, an ability that plays a significant role in the plot as Booker and Elizabeth hop forward and backward and from side to side in time, leaping from one version of Columbia to another and sometimes thrusting Booker into the past or the future. I'm going to make a note of this since Anita will ignore it for the sake of a later argument, but you can also use those terrors to help in combat situations or get around the world. So as a plot device which drives elements of the game's narrative, she's very significant. That's not what I want to hear, Anita. Tell me how she's a vehicle for the player to drive whatever perverted ideals they want into her. Tell me how sexualized she is. Tell me all the key feminist buzzwords, please, or else I won't have my cream of the SJW crop. In gameplay terms, however, Elizabeth serves a different kind of role. That of a glorified door opener. There you go. Exactly as I predicted. I haven't played the game in over two years, and yet all that has happened in that game are still fresh in my mind. That's the problem with trying to take context out of a video game, Anita. People can go back and play it and confirm for themselves whether you are lying or telling the truth. And you are so patently full of lies. As for Elizabeth being a door opener, did it ever once occur to you that someone who has an ability to open terrorists through the world might not have an ability to fire firearms, especially considering that Elizabeth has been locked in the tower all her life, as you said yourself? As with most shooters, Bioshock Infinite often puts you into situations where you can't progress until you've cleared an area of enemies. 
While Anita ignored this, the game does insist that not every situation needs to be met with violence, but the context of whether it was safe for me not to start spraying and praying was lost with how fast the game was going, so I'll give her a pass on that. The way it frequently does this is by blocking doors to the next area that can't be opened by Booker. God, what a useless protagonist. I mean, gameplay-wise, he's a glorified Neanderthal when it comes to doors. Wait, it's not sexist to make a man useless in gameplay? I see no double standard here. I'll just be on my way. Only Elizabeth can do this, which she does only when all the enemies have been killed. There are two solid reasons why this happens, Anita. One, Elizabeth doesn't want to fucking die by crossfire and be another lapse of the horrible escort missions that have played the game or two in times past. And secondly, all the enemies are fighting Booker to get to Elizabeth since she is Comstock's prize prophet once he passes a mortal plane. But nah, those guys are just mindless drones, and Elizabeth is just a poor little daffodil being torn alive by bullet fire for the sick amusement of male gamers, right? For all of her tremendous powers, Elizabeth is reduced by the game's mechanics to doing the most basic and menial of tasks. Well, what would satisfy you, Anita? Just have Elizabeth go ramble on all the enemies, charging their positions and getting ruthlessly slaughtered, causing in multiple game overs that were a faulty of the game's mechanics? Because that's what a fucking escort mission will get you, Anita! And waiting around for her to open a door becomes a significant aspect of how players experience her. Yeah, if you ignore the story around her, like Anita did, if you ignore the voxophones that build the lore, like Anita did, if you ignore all the small tidbits like strumming a guitar while Elizabeth plays a song and gives an apple to a starving city rat, like Anita did, then yes, she is merely there to hand you ammo and a thumbs up when the enemies come roaring in. But that isn't how I experienced Elizabeth, so I can only say that Anita once again is showing her incredulity to context as a whole. Let me scout ahead, see if there's some way to move forward. Notice too that Elizabeth does use her terror powers to pass through the gate in order to open it, in the midst of Anita saying that she's not using her powers. Of course she performs other actions as well, sometimes tossing book or ammo, first aid, or other useful items, or opening terrors through which she can have her summon things like weapons or killer robots to help him in combat. Well, Anita, I guess Elizabeth isn't a glorified door opener as you coined it, huh? Interesting how trying to sound worldly gets you nowhere if you can't even be tonally consistent with the terms. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea of characters who play a supporting role in combat situations. But you are just going to tell me how it's inherently wrong, Anita. Don't try to sugarcoat this like you aren't borrowed that a female, of all things, is supporting a male character, right? I'm certainly not. But that's because I don't see people as the descriptor they are before I see them as a fucking human being. But Elizabeth is an example of a female sidekick who is reduced to a tool. As would be any other NPC that isn't the player character. What kind of fucking argument is this, Anita? Any supporting character in a combat situation, be it human or thing, is in essence a fucking tool to someone else's end. It doesn't make it bad or worse that it be a female as the hammer to Booker's nail. There aren't gameplay mechanics that allow you to have meaningful interactions with her. Except for all the lore-based items that give you context as to how Elizabeth feels about the world of Columbia, including the aforementioned guitar singing duet, let's ignore that in favor of a lopsided argument despite that people can look this up, replay the game, and find it for themselves because unlike history, you can't change the nature of a fucking video game! Unless you mod it out, of course. She just opens doors and dispenses useful things, and her tear opening powers are not her own, but yours to call on and control with the press of a button. I've stressed this already, but if we were to have a meaningful gameplay interaction with Elizabeth, it would involve a whole lot of short leashing and AI that is so dumbfoundingly stupid that they will run into battle and commit suicide on most accounts. I remember in the final onslaught on Columbia, where Elizabeth was just caught in an infinite loop, riding the magnetic rail without dismounting, and where I needed her to dismount so we could continue on with the story. I literally had to restart the encounter, the hardest in the game, just so I could move forward. And that's regarding someone who is invincible throughout enemy encounters. Imagine how frustrated gamers would be if Elizabeth decides she wanted to go yippee ki on some motherfuckers with a pistol with no resourcefulness or sense of longevity on her part. It would, in fact, affect the ratings that Bioshock Infinite ultimately got. At other times, she's less like a person and more like a sexualized slot machine tossing you the occasional coin. What the fuck, Anita? 
While Elizabeth is conventionally attractive, I don't see how she is sexualized beyond a corset that reveals her ample bosom. I think that's just you projecting your own repressed sexuality and inferring that everyone else is like a 14-year-old boy who just experienced puberty seeing cleavage for the first time in his life when it's just you being perverted. How do we not know that you are just as sexist in all this, huh? You certainly don't hold women to high regard, much less women who aren't even fucking real to begin with, no less. As a glorified gatekeeper, Elizabeth joins a long tradition of female sidekicks, including Alex from Half-Life 2 and its follow-up episodes, and Yorda from the much-beloved Ico, whose magic is needed to activate doors, staircases, and other mechanisms that allow players to advance. Now, I know nothing about Ico, funny that I'm not attempting to critique a game I know nothing about, eh? But I'm just going to go on a whim here and guess that the reason you need to her to open said doors and mechanisms is because the protagonist does not have the aldritch ability to use magic like she does, much in the same way that Elizabeth uses magic to pass through certain barriers. But I do know quite a bit about Alex Vance from the Half-Life series, so let's go into that. So yes, Alex does in fact open some doors for you. But in about roughly half of those situations, she fights alongside you as she is opening said doors. What's also interesting about Alex is that while she is not indestructible, you can't simply just let her fight all the enemies, because there is a damage threshold that will result in an immediate game over because Alex, surprise surprise, is a viable character, not a glorified gatekeeper, as Anita would suggest. Also, funny that Anita says that Aiko is much beloved, presumably from people who have played video games, yet will find any way to shit on the game for her own sick and twisted narrative. Yorda also has a distinction of being the quintessential example of what I call the damsel escort mission. Anita, that doesn't make any fucking sense. A damsel, as far as I've seen from your videos, is someone who is in a constant state of peril, who needs to be rescued, and for what I can see up here, she's being led along by the protagonist, but isn't always in a manner of distress. Does that make Elizabeth a damsel or escort mission, because she too often finds herself in combat situations? Does any kind of distress mean that someone therefore becomes a damsel? You know, after making three whole videos about damsels, I'd kind of hope to never have to talk about them again. Well, good news, everyone! Anita isn't making more of these roughly poorly researched videos, not to mention that it still pales in comparison to what you originally promised in your own Kickstarter way back in 2012. But less is somehow more in Anita's eyes. But gaming's love of using helpless women as both narrative and gameplay devices was too much for even those videos to contain. Oh yeah, gaming's love of using helpless women, because developers just hate women, right? It's not like the men in those video games like being chivalristic and gentlemanly when they help women who need it, right? I'm an independent woman who don't need no man, unless it benefits me. This line certainly says a lot How about how you view women, huh, Anita? You keep saying that you are a feminist and that you support women's rights, but deep down, you are just as much the vile misogynist that you paint on the forehead of every gamer gayer and every gamer for that matter. You don't support women to choose how they please, so inevitably you don't support their choice to let a man take action in a given situation. You don't support women to dress as they please, almost demanding that every woman in video games be patently ugly, but not degrading in any way, or wear a burka to keep your moist clit from spraying like a fire hose. You don't let women do anything unless it goes through your superbly high standard of what is the conventional female choice. So how can anyone be fooled at this point that you care about the rights of women is beyond me. Damsel escort missions occur when a female character joins the male player character, but is largely helpless. Notice that every damsel escort mission involves a female being helpless to a male player character, like if it, as if that doesn't happen on the opposite end, like near Automata, for instance. But that game's sex is because the female protagonist is just too damn sexy. And rather than being a clear benefit to the player, she feels more like a burden. The burden really depends on how constructed the AI is, not that it's necessarily a male or female as a vehicle for said AI. Very intellectually dishonest of you, Anita, but I'm not fucking surprised at this point. In Ico, players free Yorda from a cage early on. She then joins Ico on this journey, and much of the game consists of solving puzzles so that Yorda, who can't make leaps or climb walls on her own, can traverse the environment. Again, I know nothing of Ico, never played it, but I'm going to try my best to fill in the blanks that Anita probably erased to make this conclusion. Perhaps, Yorda being stuck in a cage for who knows how damn long probably made her weak, malnourished, or maybe there's some kind of game-specific ring or pendant that is nullifying her inability beyond opening a door per se. 
Pure speculation, but I'm sure it doesn't just come down to her being female. Meanwhile, players also need to protect her from the shadow monsters who sometimes try to whisk her away. Makes me think that Yorda is much more narratively significant than just some glorified gatekeeper or burden, much like how the reason Princess Peach keeps getting captured by Bowser is because she is the leader of the Mushroom Kingdom. But who's the one always there, taking away the agency of someone for the fulfillment of a social justice argument? Anita Sarkeesian. Spoiler alert! Yes, in the ending cutscene, Yorda carries Aiko out of the crumbling castle. But what the narrative tells us, or shows us, in the end doesn't undo the impact of how we experience a character through the gameplay. It doesn't undo it, Anita, because it's very fucking hard to interweave gameplay with story. Imagine trying to have a conversation with someone while gunfire is flying by your head, or much less trying to talk to someone as they're being taken away by some vicious shadow monsters. Also, the fact that Yorda is black and shadow light makes me think that she became one of those shadow monsters, or would become one of them. Another classic damsel escort mission occurs in Resident Evil 4, where Ashley Graham, the president's daughter, has caused players tremendous frustration over the years by burdening them with the need to protect and manage her. Yes, because escort missions are shit, Anita. This is not exclusive or indicative of how gamers view women in video games. Also, I was sure that Resident Evil 4's escort mission was slightly better in comparison because Ashley didn't get in the way of gunfire and kept just close enough by her side so as not to run astray. But if the gamers and he is talking about have a problem with it, it was likely because escort missions are almost patently shit as soon as they put, are put into a game, no matter how well polished it may be. Whether they're presented as capable or helpless, female companions often encounter situations in which they just can't proceed on their own. And is it the sex of their body have something to do with Anita? Or is it perhaps a gameplay element that you're ignoring for the sake of saying it? has to do with them being female the reason. Also, more weasel words from Buzzword Bot here. Ellie in The Last of Us, for instance, is hardly a Yorta-like damsel, but when she encounters a body of water, she may as well be. Probably because Ellie doesn't know how to swim, Anita. Learn to swim, learn to swim, learn to swim. And Joel has to go out of his way to get her across. And another thing that Anita might be overlooking, on top of everything else she's overlooked, but maybe it's a lot easier for a grown adult to push a younger kid on a plank across water than it is for a little girl to push a grown adult on a plank across water. Just a thought. Now look, there's a lot to admire about The Last of Us. Again, Anita, we know it, you know it, you still have a problem with it, as you do with basically everything else in any game's medium, because you will never be satisfied. But I guarantee you nobody's favorite part of that game was helping Ellie get across the water. Probably because it was a waste of time and not that you had to help a female. A good rule of thumb is that if you spend any portion of a game carrying a female character around, it's a pretty safe bet that it at least has some elements of the damsel escort mission. Well, of course it would, Anita, because if it wouldn't, you'd find some other bullshit term that you've never used across your videos to say how sexist the game is. Remember, it's all about social justice, not video games. You fuckers might think that I'm taking her word for it when I didn't take her word for it when it came to saying she loved video games. But with the way she has gone about critiquing games media, I'm more inclined to believe her when she says that it's because of the social justice narrative. No, oh, you're heavier than you look. Oh yeah, Prince of Persia, where this guy knows how to parkour and fight, whereas this female, who I think might be the princess of something or whatever, doesn't. It makes you think there's more to it rather than, Step aside, woman, we men know how to do things better than you. To be clear, there's nothing whatsoever inherently wrong with depictions of people helping each other in times of difficulty. Just because you say the same thing twice in a different way does not convince me that you will still try to find a problem with it, Anita. For fuck's sake! You of all people, on the twilight of this series, trying to tell me that you don't have a problem with this or that in a video game when your entire fucking career has been all nitpicks at games you've deconstructed poorly for the sake of the nitpick. If you didn't have a problem with people, and let's face it, you mean women helping men in this situation, you wouldn't have brought it up as a problem in the first place! If anything, we could do with a lot more narratives that focus on companionship, cooperation, and support. Well, we wouldn't get any if you were in charge of how games were made, Anita. You would insist that regardless of the gameplay mechanics, and regardless of the lore built around certain female characters, that they should be able to hoist themselves by their bootstraps without any assistance from anyone, much less men, because we wouldn't want to think less of them, would we? Even though you are literally the only one who ever fucking 
does. Might want to make sure that fucking camera you talk to isn't also a mirror. But the models games give us rarely offer experiences in which this kind of support is truly mutual. Is it now, Anita? So when Booker eliminates two dozen enemies in a room, vying for capture of Elizabeth, and Elizabeth awards Booker with passage to the next arena-based room, that's somehow not mutual in any way? Or is your idea of mutual companionship be that if I give you two oranges, you give me two oranges? Doesn't seem that kind of mutual relationship could go so far. Instead, we see a pattern of men frequently caring and helping women in situations where they're otherwise helpless. As with the damsel in distress, and just as with this one, it could be that the game is playing into men and males' natural desire to help women, shiverly as most people know it. And if they didn't help them, Anina, would you not complain about the men not helping her? You need to find a problem with anything, so of course you would. So don't go here insisting that you'd be fine with the opposite outcome. This pattern is rooted in sexist ideas about men as protectors, and women as the ones who need this kind of protection. Well, not surprised you'd find it sexist, yet men like to be protectors and women like to be protected. Why do you think the term white knight exists, huh? It could also be that men are biologically more physically strong compared to women, and said sexual dimorphism created this bond where the man would protect and the women would provide. How is it that some layback screaming at his laptop mic knows that, but some acclaimed academic who got paid $250,000 doesn't? Social justice, I tell you. It's coded into the gameplay that men are the ones who kill and protect, and that women are the ones who experience moments of helplessness and need to be carried. Yeah, it's not like the men who are lucrously slaughtering people are experiencing trauma of their own kind. It's not like Booker DeWook had been involved in the massacre of Wounded Knee and its past revisited him in some fucked up exhibit displaying the Native Americans as savages and the Americans as glorious patriots. Not like, spoiler alert, Booker's entire internal struggle with saving Elizabeth was him actually trying to save his daughter that was stolen from him by an alternate version of himself. I mean, what kind of misogynist would Booker be for trying to save his daughter from captivity, huh? When these female characters are of aid to the player, it's often in rudimentary ways, as a glorified door opener, or even as a more basic tool. You really do love hammering home the same talking points, huh? But I guess that's really all you have up to this point. Nothing more significant to add to this, and even the argument you are making is perhaps dishonest. In the Ocarina of Time dungeon, inside Jabu Jabu's belly, players must carry the snobby Princess Ruto around. At one point, even using her as a weight to press down a switch. Note the term snobby, for that I'm sure will play no significance to why you have to carry her around. Also, perhaps the switch is affected by weight and doesn't turn on once you got the poor, helpless female on it. And in Metal Gear Solid V, you've got four sidekick options to take with you on missions. A dog, a horse, a robot, and a woman. <sighs> the point is, you call me a sexist if there were no female companions that you could use in this instance, or that I'm not using the female companion for all my missions, even though I'm sure they did this to give you the choice to use them to your own discretion. You can, in fact, not use any of them and still get through the game with no problem. Finally, female companions often function as cheerleaders, doling out little ego boosts to players for gunning down bad guys or pulling off other feats. You know a little positive reinforcement goes a long way. Why can't a female companion show some amount of gratitude for something that the protagonist does? Oh yeah, that's right. In Aenea's mind, that makes gamers EXPECT SEX from them somehow. Along with the glorified door opening and the damsel-like aspects, female sidekicks are there to make players feel better about themselves. And that's wrong because, uh, not sure exactly. I guess Anita wants every game just to basically loathe the person with the controller, huh? It's like Spec Ops The Line, but instead of tackling the subject of war in a smart manner, it morally grandstands and goes mom on all the players, like as if it's wrong to want to help people when they need it. To make them feel important and skilled. Dang. Yeah, who would expect the player character to feel important? It's not like as if they are playing the protagonist who is central to the story or anything. Sometimes, I like to think you are being this intentionally retarded, Anita, and at other times, I just think you are just fucking retarded when it comes to the basis of a game's narrative. You did it! You did it! Wow! You're so cool! You're just trying to impress me. Were you impressed? Got all those guys all by myself? Yeah, I just defeated a giant combine infrastructure with my gravity gun and dashing looks, 
But uh, what I really want from Alex after doing that is to shame me for it and tell me how every combine I just killed had lives of their own, right? Every accomplishment that I make in a fucking game should be met with disdain and vitriol because pixel lives matter, and those pixels on the screen weren't just trying to kill me in the game, too. It doesn't make sense in the world for Alex to congratulate me because she too wanted the Combine Forces eliminated. No, 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 no. She's a revolutionary who cares about the lives she's throwing away. The fuck you on about, Anita? But these interactions are rarely depicted as mutually supportive. Often, rarely, nearly, sometimes. May I go on how Anita is a weasel on top of being a con artist? Also, how do you know? That it isn't mutually supportive for both people. Isn't Alex going to get killed if you don't do anything to help her? Isn't Elizabeth going to get killed or indoctrinated if you don't do anything to help her? But I shouldn't help them because I would be perpetuating stereotypes in real life through a fictional world. But I should help them because if they were to die, you'd call me a misogynist for it. Nice news you got me hanging from here, Anita. It's not nearly as common in these scenarios for the male player character to offer emotional support to their female sidekick. Probably because females and women in general are much better at bestowing emotional support, especially given a war scenario where all emotion is suppressed in order to deal with the threat at hand. But it's apparently not sexist for men not to display emotion or reach a hand out to women at times of need. Or that because it doesn't happen as often, often as the opposite to occur, thereby it doesn't happen at all. To tell her that she's doing a great job. You know, there are in fact other ways to elicit that kind of response, right? Also, why the fuck would an NPC character that is controlled by a mindless AI care about gaining gratitude from the player character? If Quiet from the Phantom Pain was controlled by another player, then yes, I could most definitely see the need to harbor mutual gratitude if said player gets a nice headshot at the right moment, or perfectly executes an infiltration on some kind of base. But as far as that's concerned, there are an emotionless, unthinking non-player character who should only get gratification in regards to scripted events. These particular sidekicks aren't designed as characters that players can actively engage in developing a relationship with. Again, how so? Unless you decide that you can only have a meaningful relationship through gameplay means, and what a hell of an arbitrary rule on top of the countless others from your previous videos, you aren't meant to get an emotional bond from someone through shooting guns or opening fucking doors. Also, might I suggest playing co-op if you truly want some kind of meaningful relationship via gameplay? Oh wait, co-op doesn't exist for the sake of this argument, and no male character ever gets hoisted into the same sidekick boots as females do apparently, or when they do, apparently the story now matters to the meaningful relationship. That's one of my grain of straw you're picking there, Anita. Characters who are fully fleshed out people with their own goals and desires that sometimes require players to compromise their own wants or desires. Anita, do you not think that by being the escort for the escortee, risking your neck and picking yourself clean to the bone to help uh, keep these people alive is somehow not compromising their own wants and desires. Sure, it would be wanting of me if Elizabeth could shoot a gun like I could and never die and just kill all the baddies for me, but then I, as a player character, would have literally no reason to assist her in any way, and me protecting her at every cost is me compromising my own fucking livelihood for her wants and desires, like to go to Paris. Also, Elizabeth does in fact talk to you about her wants and desires outside of gameplay, because, once again, try having small talk while a militia is armed to the teeth, ready to spit lead in your general direction. I mean, I know that any bullet that could hit me will leave me incapacitated and die in a slow, miserable death, but I want to talk about my feelings right fucking now! This pattern of female sidekicks who serve more as gameplay devices, door openers, and ego boosts than as people Oh yeah, sure, because when I'm killing people who probably have lives of their own they want to go back to, it's not like I'm treating them like vermin on my doorstep that I apathetically smash with a boot, or that the very reason I am killing people is to save the life of someone else who just so happens to give me some help along the way, because that in no way makes me treat them like a human being somehow. Is a design approach rooted in the idea of games as power fantasy. Players get to feel powerful and important, sometimes issuing orders that are obeyed without hesitation or doubt. Because that's what any game should do, make the player feel powerful. Do you know the one reason why Sunset, an indie SJW game, failed to make any sales or elicit any excitement? 
because you didn't feel powerful. You were a housemaid who did chores in some fucker's house while the real excitement was happening somewhere else for you to spectate. Other than the fact that it was boring, it suffered Poe's law, and the creators were rude and bitchy when their reception of the game came poorly. In an alternate universe where women were the ones who enjoyed playing games at a hardcore level and the men didn't, guess what, Anita? The games wouldn't fucking change the dynamic of the protagonist or player character to feel powerful in the world that they are playing. In fact, I'm almost sure the women who do enjoy hardcore games now like the idea of putting themselves in the shoes of someone who is powerful, regardless, be it man or woman or Z. Companion dynamics in games almost never model what equal footing, cooperation, and collaboration in a relationship might look like, but instead serve to make the player feel like the center of the world. Anita, if you want to have games that have equal footing, cooperation, and collaboration in a meaningful way, then play a multiplayer game, play a co-op game, because you're not going to find that playing a single player game because NPCs are designed not to be as central as the player character for fuck's sake. How is it? One of the most basic fundamentals of a game goes right over your fucking head and that not only do you not get it, but try to attribute your lack of understanding of the idea of being the protagonist in a game centered around you as sexist too. I can only assume that you are being this incredulous for the sake of the argument at hand, which is basically a phrase that summarizes the entirety of tropes v. women, have an established argument or bias, and distort fact to make it suit said established argument or bias. The one in control, which is not at all a model for healthy relationships. Because submissive and dominant don't exist in real world relationships, right? It's not like people insist to one another for someone to take control in a relationship. I got a little submissive side to me. I like the idea of a woman who's more sexually inclined to take me as her little Sibian. And surprisingly enough, I don't think of it as sexist in any way or think of it as unhealthy so long as I get a mutual offer in exchange, which I inevitably will from the fact that I'm having sex in the first place. Also, video games where you interact with fictional characters on a screen aren't the ideal place to find a healthy relationship anyway, but maybe that's how you bolster such a great relationship with John McIntosh, right? Of course, a huge number of games focus on men fighting alongside other men, and in these games, the male companions often have some of the same characteristics we sometimes see in female companions. So you have just demonstrated that this is not exclusive to females, nor is it exclusive to males, that when you find yourself as the only person who can control fundamentally how you go about dealing with a given situation, the AI that inhabit the world will move aside for you, no matter the gender or race of the person. So what the fucking fuck fuckity is the point of this video anyway? This is your last bell ringing on this long forgotten and dredged up series, and this is what you have to show for it. $250,000 over the disgrace of video game analysis and critique. What the fuck kind of world do I live in where the price of an Audi RAGT will get you this shit? Because it's clearly not a sane or functioning one. It's very common for male characters to compliment the player on their good shooting or to breach a door that the player character can't open himself. At this point, I'm just waiting for the chinks in her brain to try to reason somehow why, when you have male companions helping the player character, that's not nearly as bad or even sexist when it's done for the female characters, because she's done it before. She's conveniently ignored all the male body types in Overwatch that were similar in shape and size, she conveniently ignored all the variety of female body types, and not even sex anything types, in League of Legends, she conveniently ignored the female fighters finding another female so to suit her conclusion that the game is reinforcing male dominance, like with Gears of War 3, I really am waiting in the wings on a probably 40 or 50 minute video on how full of double think web and it will spin to keep this narrative afloat. However, typically these characters are presented as equal participants in the conflict. In shooters ranging from Call of Duty to Gears of War, the player's male companions are armed and active and are portrayed as playing their part to fend off or eliminate the enemy threat. There it is! Oh, thank you, Anita, for double thinking yourself into oblivion. Also, Gears of War 3, mind you, has two playable female characters that play their part to fend off said enemy threat. So nice job lying again, Anita. I noticed you were playing trailer footage of Gears of War 1 and not Gears of War 3. Otherwise, your argument would have sunk like the miserable little floatsome it is. 
Occasionally in these games, male characters do have to protect other men. But unlike scenarios in which men protect women, these less common instances don't reinforce pre-existing cultural attitudes about men, women, and gender. And the flourish is the pseudo-intellectual word soup combined with the double think web. I think I'll take my check and my mint out the door, thank you, because like with Anita, I'm selective with my choices of meal to dine. Except that Anita is selective in what or it is or isn't sexist or offensive. Similarly, the occasional situation in which a female character protects a male one, which happens in the 2013 Tomb Raider reboot, among other games, also isn't a problem, because it doesn't work to reinforce limiting, harmful ideas about women or men that already exist in our culture. I know that Anita sounds like a fucking genius right now, but let me translate it for you. I don't have a problem with it because I only hate it when a man assists a woman full stop. When you break down all the wishy-washy terms, Anita just sounds like a high school valley bitch who's jealous that men don't throw themselves out to help her in her time of need. Also, in the instances where women help men, notice that it almost always involves a physical restraint, like say a battered knee or a severed limb. But when it comes to women, usually it's because they don't know how to fire a gun or something of that equivalent. Again, this probably comes down to sexual dimorphism, but isn't it funny that even in the veil of Anita's bullshittery, that you can actually dig through the dirt and find a diamond of an analogy in it. And also without obfuscating the language so you don't show your obvious bias in towards one thing and not another. In other words, we live in a culture that says, generally speaking, men should be the protectors and women should be the protected. Yeah, how misogynist of them, but also how misogynist of our culture expect women to take the draft or insist that men be the first out of a sinking boat or downed airplane. It's only sexist when it benefits you as usual. But as I have said before in prior videos tackling the news dribble, cultures don't make up men to be protectors and women to be protected. We develop that naturally through thousands of years of tribalism and hierarchy, and the culture becomes emasculated in it as a result. Also note the word should, as it isn't the same as have to be because guarantee you that A. Skrillex isn't going to be capable of protecting women or Ronda Rousey isn't going to step down to, to a fight with another man. When women function as confident companions whose skills are more or less equal to those of the player character, it can challenge these ideas. Not everyone is created equal, Anita. Yes, we should treat everyone equally. But that does not mean that Elizabeth knows how to wield a gun as Booker can, nor should Booker know how to emit a terror through space and time like Elizabeth can. Did you ever happen to think that one particular skill that someone has can in fact complement another? Or is everything to you some big giant abacus, where nothing is added upon another thing in a complementary term? The Last of Us goes against the grain by giving us the character of Tess, a somewhat rare and refreshing example of a woman who fights alongside the male protagonist. Okay, Anita, that's all fine and Danny, but notice that Tess still isn't the central focus of the game like Joel is from The Last of Us? Shouldn't it still be sexist in your eyes by default of the protagonist being the center of the world, and God forbid a central character be central to the world, yet you somehow attribute this person as the exclusive amongst the bunch? It could also be that Tess and Joel have the same inherent abilities as you described and do not gain mutual camaraderie through working on someone else's strengths. And the later Gears of War games do a decent job of including female squad members who are on equal footing with their male counterparts. God, I am so fucking pissed that she includes Gears of War 4 in this instance, but fails to address Gears of War 3, which did the EXACT SAME THING, mind you. But do remember that being a social justice coward, you have to keep your narrative intact, or else that your previous refrain about Gears of War 3 being a reinforcement tool of male dominance falls apart when you consider that you could play as a female companion throughout the entire fucking game. Nah, Gears of War 3 now doesn't exist in Aenea's brain, and let's call it the LATER Gears game rather than Gears of 4, or else people are going to call you on your bluff when you go quiet on Gears, th Gears 3, you FUCKING DISINGENUOUS LEECH OF MONEY AND GOODNESS! And thankfully, we're seeing more games that complicate and subvert the old patterns, providing players with relationships with supporting characters who don't function as mere extensions of the player, but who feel like separate individual people. Yes, 
glorified, as I'm using the word here, interactive novels that make sure that every person you come across is morbidly depressed and has 14 different identities applied to it like they are a dodecahedron of sexualities, and that they make sure that the protagonists not only have so little impact on the world that they experience, but when they do have impact, smack the player with a biased moral arbiter that feels like the developers self-injected their own insecurities onto the player to make themselves feel better. That's what I should be spending my time and money on, not games that are fun to play and experience and could also juggle a good story in the mix like a video game salad. The 2016 indie title One Night Stand throws players into a situation with a female character who clearly has her own feelings and her own desires. Let's check out this game since I've never heard of it. I'm sure it probably got mass livestream play on YouTube or got a spotlight in the now defunct G4 channel. Oh, wait. As a $3.20 minute snooze fest that hits you over the head with moral objections without any satisfying conclusion. A typical indie game, moving on. In Left Behind, the wonderful add-on for The Last of Us, Ellie's companion Riley is not someone players can issue orders to or someone they have to protect. Probably because the entirety of that DLC was just an interactive novel, much like with One Night Stand, where you couldn't do much besides interact with the environment and get a whole exposition lane and doll of backstory into the characters. Not something that should, or could, warrant demands. Riley is constantly active, often taking control of the situation, sometimes competing and being playful with Ellie, and as a result, she doesn't feel anything like the companion characters in most games. Probably because neither of you are out doing anything. You are just both faffing about in what looks like an abandoned mall because the two characters in question are young and boisterous, still wanting to have fun despite all the apocalypse before them. Or even anything like Ellie herself felt in the original game. Okay, I don't know a whole lot about The Last of Us, but I'm sure that Left Behind takes place before the events of The Last of Us, and implying from the title of the DLC to the events of now, where you don't see Riley, something bad must have happened to Riley that made Ellie change overall as a person through the events of The Last of Us. Just a possibility, perhaps it does have something to do with sexism, Anita, but maybe just for fucking once! Could it not be? Instead, she feels much more like a real person accompanying Ellie on the journey. And while Trico in 2016's The Last Guardian may not be a human character, he does possess some of the characteristics we'd like to see more of in human companions and games. What, how Trico never listens to anything you say and bugs the fuck out, and that the game itself took seven years to be released in a buggy, messy version? Yeah, I'm sure those devs are really clamoring for that shit, right? Asking Trico to do things isn't a simple matter of pushing a button and watching him immediately obey. You could say, Anita, that this is in fact one good example of a shitty escort mission. Fuck. Escort mission is almost becoming a staple on here like Adam's apple was to my video on Justin Dennis. He's not a simple tool. Well, I'll give you that. He's two headaches and a teaspoon to balance on a thimble of your tongue of a tool. Not just an extension of the player. Sometimes he's hesitant, reluctant, even frustrating. Frustrating is the only thing that players leave with turning off The Last Guardian and throwing it to the flames of overhyped games to come. But this makes it feel more like he's a living, breathing creature with thoughts and feelings of his own. Anita, I wouldn't normally suggest another video to you, but go watch Video Game Donkey's video on The Last Guardian and tell me if Trico left a loving, everlasting impression on him. Because I can guarantee you it didn't, but it had nothing to do with him being some kind of bird dog thing, or him being male or female or whatever bullshit crutch you use to excuse similar aspects of a game against another. And by taking time to pet him, you can sometimes express your connection to him in ways that fall outside of the requirements of the gameplay and the story. Same goes with Bioshock Infinite, but since the companion in that story is a girl and the player character is a man, now time to conveniently ignore all the little tidbits that would have allowed you to engage with Elizabeth outside of gameplay and story. And once again, Anita! I can still find empathy with Elizabeth as a human being inside gameplay, inside story, or outside story and inside gameplay, and outside gameplay and inside story, because Elizabeth is one of the most interesting and perhaps most recent, recent icon of strong female characters. But you have to shit on everything, as you always do, being the party pooper for the sake of it, tearing shits on games who have no right to be shat on, all in the name of your fucking social justice slacktivism. Get fucked, Anita. I'm almost happy that your stupid series is over and you have thoroughly wasted feminist money on drivel like this, if somewhat sad that you don't continue making a farce out of everything you say or do. 
And crucially, Trico is often the one protecting the player, rather than the other way around. This is what you get when you take any power the protagonist has and give it to an AI who can only function through basic yet extremely rudimentary means. You get Dunkey wanting to kill Trico and wishing death upon him in who knows how many hours of playing an overhyped mess of a game. He does not exist to fuel a power fantasy, but to allow for gameplay mechanics that focus on cooperation, care, and helping each other. The only power fantasy that would elicit from any gamer playing that is to take a plushie of Trico and violently stab all the puff out of it for how constantly it misinterpreted a command you made or apathetically watch you fall to your death when it could have saved you at any moment. No one feels powerful playing that game and no one should feel powerless as a protagonist in their own fucking game, Anita. But please keep following the balls while deep throwing the cock, Anita. I'm sure you'll eventually find some complaint about the game in future, assuming this isn't the last of the series. When supporting female characters in games don't have this kind of depth, when they exist primarily to be protected or to be ordered around, they not only reinforce harmful ideas about gender, they also fail as characters. Well, you heard it here, folks. The cat's out of the bag. The jury's in. Elizabeth, Ellie, Ashley Graham, they are horrible characters because they aren't as useful or more useful than the protagonists. It's not by how well they were written or how their motivations are totally consistent with how they act. It's not by whether you get a good experience with the character across the board and not by simply gameplay elements. By Anita's sanctimonious words of virtue and truth, do we pull the sheep off this wolf and see the sexism for what it is. Oh, truly, it is a gay time for social justice to continue infesting its little tendrils into our daily lives so we can finally rid ourselves of these harmful ideas. And infest it shall, for while Anita's certainly done with this shit singing on video games for the last time, the damage has already been done. Developers and publishers capitulating and playing it safe, like as if we needed that more often. Pervasive games, journalism, couching the gamers about how sexy they are, and not whether they even hold a gaming cell in their body, and games being censored, sanitized, and heavily scrutinized by many a triggered feminazi until all the fun is sucked out for morals and narratives. What a fucking time to be alive in a world full of nonsense. Well, I think this is going to be my longest video I've ever done in this revival hell, the entirety of my YouTube career. But Anita is both impressive and appalling at making back and forth bullshit statements with rapid fire succession. As with the Twilight movies, we might be done with them, but Twilight isn't done with us. See you next time.